Good morning. Uh, let me welcome you to this online service for Greenwell Street Presbyterian Church. We're delighted you're joining with us and we pray that the Lord will richly bless us as we worship together this morning. It is, of course, with regret that following the announcement of our local executive that they're going to continue the lockdown for a further four weeks that our own denomination has, in keeping with that decision, decided that we would uh, not meet publicly uh, or until that date as well. But we'll continue this online provision and trust that it will be of some help uh, to you. Services continue this evening at 7 o'clock when we're looking together at First Peter. Then our daily devotionals, Monday to Friday, and on Tuesday evening, our Bible teaching and prayer time. I trust that you do find these helpful and that the Lord will richly bless you as you spend time in his word. Well, let us worship God together. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. We join together in worship of God as we sing our opening praise, Great is Thy Faithfulness. together in prayer let us pray 
Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, as we turn to you this morning, we do so mindful, O Lord, that it is you alone who is worthy of our praise. Mindful that it is you that has watched over and protected us through the hours of the night, brought us safely to a new morning, blessed us with the food we have eaten, the clothes we wear, the warmth and shelter of our homes, surrounded us with the love and support of family and of friends. And above all, you have blessed us with the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in him all the riches of your blessings are showered upon us. We come, O Lord, to worship you, and yet we recognise we are unable to as we ought. Father, we are humbled when the scriptures remind us that times this tongue that would sing your praise has been harsh in speaking to others, unkind in the words that we have spoken. Father, we come to seek your forgiveness we thank you, O Lord, that you have made provision for us in the Lord Jesus and that it is through his own shed blood that we can know cleansing. And yet we thank you too for the grace of your Holy Spirit, for without him we would continue steadfast in our sins. But he has been given to convict us of sin, of righteousness and of judgment to come. He's been given to open our eyes to see ourselves in the light of your glory and to see Christ as our only hope of salvation. We pray that in the course of this service, as we not only sing your praise, but the truth of those words may truly dawn on our hearts and minds. And as we later turn to your word, that that will be a living word to us as it speaks your truth into our hearts and that we might be given grace to respond, offering you these lives to be used in your service for the sake of your dear Son, our Saviour, even Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to listen to a song which has as its theme, Trust in the Lord. We're thinking today, both in terms of the opening call to worship and then later in the passage of God's faithfulness toward us. And so this is a very appropriate setting of the verses from Proverbs chapter 3. <laughs> Trust in the Lord, lean not on your own understanding. In all, all of your ways, acknowledge Him. He'll make your path straight. Trust, trust in the Lord.
Well, we pick up again in the questions and answers of the Heidelberg Catechism. We're on Lord's Day 4. That's covering questions 9 to 11. If you are watching this, the questions and answers will scroll in front of you. And I invite you to respond with me in the answers. Question 9. But doesn't God do man an injustice by requiring in his law what man is unable to do? Answer. No. God created man with the ability to keep the law. Man, however, tempted by the devil, in reckless disobedience, robbed himself and his descendants of these gifts. Question 10. Will God allow such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished? Answer. Certainly not. He is terribly angry about the sin we are born with, as well as the sins we personally commit. As a just judge, he punishes them now and in eternity. He has declared, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. Question 11. But isn't God also merciful? Answer. God is certainly merciful, but he is also just. His justice demands that sin committed against his supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty, eternal punishment of body and soul. Now, boys and girls, we have been following through the Heidelberg Catechism. We have already seen that our only hope uh, is to be in Christ. And yet the early questions of the Catechism are reminding us why we need such a hope at all, why we need to be saved. It's setting before us what sin is really like. And on our last occasion, we saw that we had sinned and come short of God's glory. Adam disobeyed God. And with him, we all fell into sin. Well, the questions that arise now in the next bit of the catechism are questions that even grown-ups would sometimes ask about God and his purposes. And the one I want us to think about this morning, but isn't God also merciful? God is merciful, but he is also just. Let's go back into the Garden of Eden once again. God has prepared a wonderful place and he has set Adam and given him Eve in that garden. It's a garden that is blessed with God's presence. It's God's blessing is upon the crops that he's sowing and growing. It's upon the relationship together. Everything is just absolutely perfect. But because God has made man so that he can choose whether to obey or disobey God. He's not an, a robot. He gives them this challenge. One tree in the garden, you're not to eat of it. And that's the one thing. One tree in, one, in the whole garden, he's not to eat of it. But what does Adam do? Tempted by the devil, he chooses to go against God. He chooses to go against the one who made him. Now, God can't just ignore that. God had already warned Adam, in the day you eat, you will die. God's character demands that what is wrong is punished. And so Adam and Eve are punished. They're cast out of God's presence. The Bible tells us that they died in sin. And then, of course, later on, they would physically die as well. God was just for one sin. Adam was cast out of the garden. And boys and girls, it's important for us to understand that God takes sin very, very seriously. And we are going to see in the coming weeks how God is indeed not only merciful, but he's gracious toward us as well. If and when we confess our sin and acknowledge it before him. Well, we're going to sing together a song which reminds us that it is God who has provided what we need in Jesus Christ. And that is S-A-L-V-A-T-I-O-N, Salvation.
Let us turn then in the Word of God to read together. We're reading from Isaiah chapter 24, verse 21, and then the whole way through chapter 25. Isaiah 24, verse 21, and right through chapter 25. This is the Word of God. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvellous things, things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honour you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners, as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, but Moab will be trampled under him as straw is trampled down in the manure. They will spread out their hands in it as a swimmer spreads out his hands to swim. God will bring down their pride, despite the cleverness of their hands. He will bring down your high fortified walls and lay them low and bring them down to the ground, to the very dust. And in that day, the song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter. The nation that keeps faith. Amen. We thank God for this reading in his own inspired and inerrant word. Well, let us turn together in prayer as we remember others. And as we come to pray together let me just encourage you with this extended lockdown please be in touch with one another phone neighbours and friends even maybe on a daily basis just for a few minutes chat how valuable and helpful that can be let's pray father we turn to you we are like those of old who said to whom else can we go father the hopes that were built up prior to Christmas with a vaccine now released and being rolled out have been dashed because, Lord, we still see numbers climbing. We still see the infection rate whilst it's dropping. There's still so many being admitted to hospitals, so many still in intensive care, so many lives still being lost. And now we have this variant which could be more transmissible and more lethal. Father, we cry out to you. Have mercy upon us. Lord, as your church, we recognise that as a nation, all we deserve is your judgment. For over these many years, your, this nation has turned its back upon your word. We're mindful again in these days, Lord, when, when all these things can so easily distract us of the ongoing challenges that face us in the abortion legislation. And Father, we're hearing such sad stories of people applying online for 
tablets that they can take to abort a child and to do that in their own homes, totally unsupervised and often unsupported. What a tragedy when a desires to pursue their own aims, they're willing to put another young mother at such risk. Lord, we pray for your church and your people and indeed many others who value life from conception and who are seeking to encourage the government to look again at the legislation and to bring in safeguards for father what was passed is obscene in the extreme and we cry out to you for you are the giver of life and lord if we are grieved by what we behold surely your righteous anger must be stirred against it and so it can come as no surprise to us that as a nation we are presently feeling the effects of this particular virus. Do we deserve to be freed of it? The answer must surely be no, we don't. But Father, you're a merciful God and so we cry out to you. Oh, Father, that you would turn the hearts and minds of men and women to you. Lord, at present, they're so consumed with themselves, their own self-interests, the pursuit of their own desires and longings. And Father, you are totally disregarded. Will you move by the power of your Holy Spirit? Bring such an awakening upon the hearts and minds of men and women and boys and girls that there will be a cry heard throughout the land. What must we do to be saved? Father, forgive us, your church, when we have not interceded as we ought, when we have not prayed as we ought. Forgive us when we have been more taken up in prayer about our own welfare and well-being than we have about our neighbours or our nations. We pray again for all those involved in the front line of combating this disease, whether that's in science laboratories with the further development of vaccines, whether that's in wards in hospitals, doctors and nurses and the ancillary staff, whether that's those uh, nurses engaged in the rollout of the vaccine, whatever it is, Lord, we pray that you would watch over to keep these people safe so that they can do their job of helping others. Father, we pray for ourselves. Lord, we are being asked to stay at home and yet for some that is difficult because being at home means being alone. We pray for all of those who are solitary at this time. We pray, Lord, that your presence might be felt and known all the more. That a call, a card from a neighbour, a friend, a member within the life of the church might be a means of encouragement and help. Father, may we seek to support one another in these practical ways through these days. And Father, whilst we are going to be without the opportunity for public worship for some extra weeks, Lord, may this only serve to drive us more and more to our knees in pleading with you for mercy and in thankfulness that in the normal course of events we have had the opportunity to meet and worship together. Lord, may there be stirred within us a renewed desire to be in the company of God's people so that when occasion does arise that we can be back together and when all restrictions are lifted, Lord, our building will not hold the numbers longing to be in the presence of Almighty God and amongst his people morning and evening. The upper room will not hold the numbers meeting together to intercede before the throne of grace and give thanks to Almighty God. Father, we look to you that you by your gracious spirit might yet do a mighty thing in our day. As we shortly turn to your word, grant us grace to understand it, to thrill in its truth and to live by the one who has given it. And to that end we ask all these things 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we turn to the word of God, let us join to sing together the hymn, Loved Before the Dawn of Time. to the word of God into the prophet Isaiah as we continue to look together in this lengthy message that the Lord gave to his people and of course to us through his servant Isaiah. We are looking over these weeks in the section chapters 13 through 27 and we have mentioned that there are three main themes within these chapters. There is the fall of nations and then the final judgment, which we looked at in chapter 24 last week, and the deliverance of his people. And it's the third of these, the deliverance of his people, that we turn to look at this morning in chapters 25 through 27. We can see why when we read passages such as this, Isaiah is often referred to as the evangelist of the Old Testament. We are, of course, familiar with those passages that speak so clearly about Christ and his crucifixion and then the latter chapters that are exhorting us to seek the Lord while he may be found, crying out to the Lord for salvation and mercy. But here in chapters that perhaps we wouldn't normally read, we're seeing time and time again these wonderful little cameos of what salvation truly is. And of course, in spite of the judgment that's pronounced, there is always this optimism in the prophet Isaiah with regard to God's people. And that, of course, not just as we have seen the Israel as they were from the flesh or descendants of Abraham, but all who belong to the true Israel, all who trust in Christ. And in this chapter, there are chapters, there's a clear echo of Isaiah 12, where the theme is 
salvation and indeed it begins in exactly the same way in that day. We find it here, the first verse we read, Isaiah 24, 21, in that day, 26, 1, in that day, 27, 1, in that day. We've seen before the close connection between final judgment and future glory. And we see this, can't we, in the Passover analogy. We have it in Isaiah 26, 20. Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. Now that is just a picture, isn't it, of what happened at the Passover. God was coming in judgment upon the Egyptians. The firstborn were going to die in this judgment. And if the children of Israel were to be safe, they were to go into their houses where they would be protected by the blood daubed on the doorposts. And what would be judgment for Egypt would at the same time be salvation for Israel. And so you find these two things, these two themes always very closely linked. We see that, don't we, with the coming of Christ. There's the one coming, the one return, the one second coming of Christ, and that will both be for the final judgment of the world, and it will also be for the instigation of the new heavens and the new earth. That is, it will be to exercise judgment, but it will also be to bring in the glory of the new heavens and new earth. So this morning, I want us to look through the eyes of Isaiah at what God planned to do and how that plan will ultimately be carried through. So the prophet opens this section, chapter 25, by affirming one of the great attributes of God and how it is seen in the history of mankind. We see it in verse 1. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvellous things, things planned long ago. Now let's pause and reflect on these things. It's all too easy to run over these introductory words. This is vitally important. Where is God's faithfulness seen according to the prophet? Because you have done things you planned. You have done things you planned. You're perfect in your faithfulness because what you planned, what you put in place, what you promised to do, you've done that. You've done that. You have kept your word. And how often we find throughout the Old Testament these sorts of words uh, re-echoed time and time again. Numbers 23, 19, for example. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Or we can come over into an earlier chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 14 and uh, verse 24, where there we read, The Lord Almighty has sworn, Surely, as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will stand. You could find it also in Isaiah 37, 26, Isaiah 46, verse 11. And then we leap forward into the New Testament just to see that what we're learning in the Old Testament is the same truth about the same God in both of these testaments. Ephesians 1, 11. In him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So that is, the passing of history is but the unfolding of what God himself has planned long ago. And indeed, planned, we are told, in eternity. Now, what was that plan? Well, that plan is summarised for us very concisely in Genesis chapter 3. You will know what is happening Genesis chapter 3, it's where sin comes into the world. It's where we're given the account of the fall. And what were the consequences of that fall? Well, we're told, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike your heel. 
Now that's it summarised. We'll come back to that in a moment. But what a great comfort it is in these days. Listen, nothing is happening in God's world outside of God's control. God's purpose is being fulfilled. We may not see it. We may not understand it. We look at what's happening at present and we say to ourselves, how could a God allow something like this to happen? Ask yourself the question. Very often, the vaccines that we receive actually contain a small dose of the virus we're trying to counteract. Now, only for the fact that we know that this is a good way to build up our own resistance to these things, anybody not knowing that would be asking us, are you mad injecting yourself with a virus? Wouldn't that be a silly thing to be doing if we didn't know that this is actually to build up our own resistance against it? Or in the case of someone requiring an amputation, the very thought of removing the leg seems horrific. Well, it's not horrific if it's a matter of lose part of your leg in order to save your life. You see, we are very quick to jump on the things that we think God should do, when in actual fact we do strange things, but only because we know that there is a better good comes out of even the hurt that we do do. And so it is with God. We do not know the end from the beginning, but we know God knows. We know he knows. We know he has planned it all from before, from long ago, and that he has done all these marvellous things uh, since that day to this. So we want to focus on three things that find the roots in Genesis chapter 3, 15. The first one is this, God's redemption of a people. God's redemption of a people. What happened in Eden? Well, we're all familiar, aren't we, with the events of Genesis chapters 2 and 3. The Lord created Adam, placed him in a garden, blessed him with the companionship of Eve, and together they are to enjoy the company of God, the lordship over creation, and each other's company. But what happened? Well, we all know this, don't we? They rebelled against God. That simple instruction, the day you eat, you will die. They're not to eat of the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. What happened? Well, they were banished from God's presence, weren't they? They became in that moment enemies of God. They had set their hearts against God. They were cast out of his presence. And so we're told they were subjected to death and subjected to the effects of the curse. But, and this is a very important but, Immediately in that context, we see in Eden the promise of a redeemed people. The promise of a redeemed people. Listen again to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Enmity between your offspring, Satan, and hers, that is Satan, there will be offspring of the woman that is not your offspring. There will be those who are not your people, but are my people. There will be those who are not the seed of the serpent, but the seed of the woman. And those are, of course, they of whom Jesus would speak in John chapter 17. Father, I would that those you have given me. You see, they're not the seed of the serpent. They're the seed of the woman, aren't they? That you've given me. Or as Paul says in Ephesians 1.4, for he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. God's purpose is the redemption of a people. And there is the promise of it, the seed of the woman given in the very beginning. That seed, of course, thinking singularly, is Christ. But it is in Christ that we come to be part of that seed of the woman itself. And so we see this plan unfolding throughout Genesis and, of course, on through the rest of the Old Testament. Because even as mankind becomes increasingly evil and judgment is announced in the, uh, uh, by means of a flood, what are we told about Noah in Genesis 6 verse 8? Noah found favour, as the NIV translation 
The word also can be translated, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He has preserved his wife, his family with him. But no sooner has the flood subsided than we read again of sin beginning to rise. And then we have this profoundly significant act in the whole of redemptive history, which is the calling of Abraham and the promise of Eden is reiterated. You have it in Genesis chapter 12 when God calls Abram uh, to follow him and to come to leave his country. He says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Here is the blessing you see. The promise of Eden is being reiterated. The, the, all of mankind will not belong to the serpent, will not be the seed of the serpent. There will be those who will be the seed of the woman, who will be the true seed of Abraham. So how is that described in Isaiah? Well, it's described Isaiah 25 verse 9. This is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Isaiah 26 34. Because he trusts in you, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. Isaiah 27, uh, 13. And in that day, a great trumpet will sound and the people will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. You see, when Israel looked to others to save them, or indeed looked to themselves to save themselves from oppressors, they failed miserably, didn't they? We've seen that already. But once they looked to God, things changed. Things changed. And it's no difference today, you see. God is still doing a marvellous thing. Things that he planned long ago as he calls his people out of the world. And how are they identified? They're identified exactly the same way as they were in Isaiah's day. We trusted in him. Now we know him is the person of Christ. We have trusted in Christ. We have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And how are we to reflect on that? Just as I am, the hymn writer says, without one plea. That is, I'm nothing to plead with God. I'm nothing to bring forward as some way I can win his favour. Somehow I can uh, merit his blessing. No, I've, I've, I've no plea to make. And here's my only plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that you bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. And so in every generation, God calls his people to himself. And that is how we know that Christ will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Because God is perfectly faithful to all his promises and he will do what he has planned. So the first thing is God's redemption of a people. Secondly, we have God's reversal of death. God's reversal of death. Because not only did Adam and Eve rebel against God, they were thereby alienated from him and placed under sentence of death. Now that death would be manifest in two ways. Firstly, it would be manifest spiritually and immediately. They were cast out of the garden. In the day you eat, you will die. They did. Not physically, but spiritually. They were put out of the presence of God. They were effectually cut off from the source of life. They died spiritually. And so it was that in due course, they would die physically. Their spiritual death was immediate, but with that death, their physical death became inevitable. It was true then, it's true now. And has been in every generation in between. Paul, when he writes to the church in Ephesus, he tells them, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. And you see, that death is immediate for each and every one of us. What do I mean by that? Well, simply this. We are sinful from the moment we are conceived. 
the moment we are conceived, that moment we are spiritually dead. It's not that we are spiritually alive and then at some point in the course of development or following birth or whatever it is, we spiritually die. No, our spiritual death is immediate on us being conceived. And as a result of that, 1 Corinthians 15, for as in Adam all die, our physical death is inevitable. It's inevitable. But what's the plan? Well, Milton wrote a poem called Paradise Lost, and then he penned another poem called Paradise Regain. And I love the way one of the uh, uh, commentators on, on that poem has explained what Milton is doing. He says, Paradise Regained is replete with reversals, most notably the solution for the separation between God and humans due to sin in the Garden of Eden as described in Paradise Lost. Milton depicts Christ's victory over sin and Satan as a restorative salvation for mankind to once again be in relationship with God through Christ. And we have clear hints of this, don't we, throughout the uh, these chapters in Isaiah. Isaiah 25, 7 and 8. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. See the way the prophet has used analogies. He has used the shroud that enfolds all peoples. Well, you see, we often think of the shroud, don't we, as the, the burial shroud, what wraps us around after we've died, that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Here is this hope that death itself will be reversed and will no longer have any power over us. Isaiah 26, 19, but your dead will live, their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Again, you have it. Of course, all of these an echo of the words of Job. I know that my Redeemer lives, and even though this body should decay, yet in my flesh I shall see God. There's always been this hope given to us in the Garden of Eden, that there would be a reversal of what sin had done in our world. And that would include the reversal of death itself. And of course, when the Lord Jesus comes, we see that, don't we? He exercises his power over death. We see it in Jairus' daughter in Luke 8. We see it in Lazarus in John chapter 11. And of course, preeminently, we see it in the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself from the dead. And so it is that the Apostle Paul can write in chapter 2, verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Verse 4, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, for it is by grace you have been saved. Here it is, made us alive. You see, death sentence has been reversed. And becoming a Christian is described in the scriptures, John 5, 4, as passing from death to life. And ultimately, of course, in the resurrection of the body from the grave. We find it in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is reminding us of what Christ's resurrection means for us. And he says to us, I declare to you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must put on the imperishable and the mortal immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. What had God planned to do? He had planned and he had promised in the Garden of Eden that he would be reversing the sentence of death. And so he has done that in his son, 
and he will do that finally and ultimately at Christ's return. God's redemption of a people, God's reversal of death, the third thing, God's renewal of fruitfulness. Adam and Eve were placed in a world which was fruitful, which was continually blessing them with all that they planted and grew. But as a result of the curse, what are we told happened? Genesis 3 again, you can see how these early chapters of Genesis are just absolutely fundamental for our proper understanding of the rest of Scripture. To Adam he said, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You see, the curse would come upon the land. And throughout the Old Testament, Israel's disobedience is often punished with similar effect. Indeed, in the covenant blessings and covenant curses listed for us in Deuteronomy, chapters 27, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, this is what you read. Verse 8 and 12. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. That's God's blessing of his people. But what if you disobey? Verse 15. Verses 38 to 40. What are we told? One of the consequences. You will sow much seed in the field, harvest little, because locusts will devour it. You will plant vineyards and cultivate them, but you'll not drink the wine or gather the grapes because worms will eat them. When Christ came, unlike Adam and Eve, who were tempted in the perfect surroundings of Eden, he is tempted in the wilderness. We might say Satan's domain. And yet in Isaiah 5, where we're given the analogy of the vineyard, which was, in Isaiah's words, uh, a vineyard in which God could rightly expect uh, fruit to be born. And yet, what are we told? I sing a, one for love, a song about his vineyard, but the vineyard only produced bad fruit. Well, that analogy is picked up again in Isaiah. And we find it in Isaiah chapter 27 here in these a few verses um, and we're reminded of what it is like sing about a fruitful vineyard verse 2 verse 4 where the briars and thorns are gone verse 6 and Jacob will take root and Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit and of course we're reminded that that isn't just a blessing for them but it's for the world you see what was the promise the seed of the woman the seed of Abram, a blessing to all nations. Here is this promise, you see. God had planned, God had purposed, and God in covenant faithfulness is carrying out his purposes day by day. Now we see that, don't we, in the lives of believers. We see the Holy Spirit at work so that there's uh, the fruit of the Spirit is evident in our lives as we seek to live day by day. There's the blessings of Christ which are showered upon us. And so we're fruitful in these ways. But of course, book of Revelation describes the fruitfulness in very, very tangible terms. In chapter 22, verses we're familiar with. There we're told of a river and at the side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations and no longer Will there be any curse? You see, God's reversal, God's reversal of what had happened in the fall. God's plan and purpose. Yes, even from all eternity, God's plan to reverse the effects of the curse. And how would all that be done? Well, all that would be done in and through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. So it's no small wonder that Isaiah, throughout his prophecy, is already giving us hints of this, isn't he? He's reminding us of the one who's to come, the wonderful, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. He's the one who is to come, who's described as the branch. In, in, he's described as the branch in chapter uh, two. He's described as the uh, he's described as the shoot 
uh, isn't he, in chapter 11. And so we find him described later on as the servant of the Lord. It is the Lord Jesus in whom all these things, he is the seed of the woman, in whom all the curses of sin are reversed. God, redemption of a people, God's, then God's uh, reversal of death, and then God's renewal of fruitfulness. Two things in closing. First one, let me ask you, dear friend, where is your hope placed? When Israel's hope was placed in themselves or in others, disaster came upon them and it will be no different for you. If your hopes for the future are placed in yourself or in others, you can rest assured you have a very, very uncertain future indeed. Because you see, it is God's plans alone which are sure to be fulfilled. Your best led plans are so easily frustrated and come to nothing but not the plans of God so where is your hope placed well the prophet would say to you trust in the Lord and do not lean on your own understanding well may you hear that call of the gospel to you today but to you dear Christian friend do you not find such great comfort in knowing that even in life's darkest hours the Lord is still fulfilling his purposes. And so, in the words of Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast. Why? Because he trusts in you. Here is one of the blessings that the Lord bestows upon his people, this peace, perfect peace. In this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Well, may you know that peace reigning in your heart because you know that your God is a faithful, promise-keeping God and he has promised to keep you and to deliver you safely to glory itself. Well, may the Lord bless his word to us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the reminder of your great plans and purposes. Lord, they encapsulate the whole of time, from the very beginning of creation itself to its very end. You have been fulfilling your purposes. Father, we confess our inadequacy to understand all the whys and wherefores, but your ways are much higher than our ways, your thoughts much greater than our thoughts. Grant us that faith that simply trusts you, even when we can't see and understand all that you are doing. So accept of our thanks for your precious word to us this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us join together to sing the lovely hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>